from the proof of concept to the modern method of fMRI took a short eight years, um, from 1990 to 1998. And the, in 1990, the technique was introduced um, by Ogawa and in rats. And it took a year until the same feat was accomplished in humans. <clears throat> a year after that, there was the first PET study of memory showing activation in the hippocampus. And it wasn't until 1996 that the first uh, traditional block design study of memory using fMRI was accomplished by Sean Foster and Bruce Rosen. And uh, in 1998 saw dual publications in science of uh, the study of memory using uh, effect-related fMRI, which has become the standard of the field, in the field. And we have our own Jim Brewer um, on the West Coast and Wagner, uh, Buckner Group on the East Coast. <clears throat> in these early studies, uh, <clears throat> research teams tended to be collaborations between psychologists, neurologists, and neuroscientists on the one hand, who knew about the study of memory um, and the nature of memory and physicists, radiologists, engineers, on the other hand, who knew how to measure the signal, how to tweak the machines, how to run the machines. Um, most scanning took place on clinical scour. Clinical scanners, um, which were relatively low strike magnets, in off hours. So you did your research in the middle of the night, on the weekend, and you hope that there was no automobile accident that would uh, eject you from your experiment. Nowadays, memory research can be done independently by psychologists, So on this side of the session, the hippocampus is here. 
direction. And so if you're, you're going to be averaging tissue in the hippocampus with other tissue in the same structure, hippocampus with hippocampus, parapicamal gyrus with parapicamal gyrus, and you would avoid averaging um, gray matter in the hippocampus with this adjacent white matter. Next I'll discuss the challenges in identifying the memory signal itself. And early on in the study of memory, finding hippocampal activity was actually the exception and not the rule. So in those earlier studies that I mentioned, um, most of the activity was found in parahippocampal gyrus, not in hippocampus itself. And um, it sounds like a very simple um, approach to studying something. So memory, why not just present familiar items for which there should be a memory, and novel items where there should be no memory, and compare activity for those two conditions. It turns out, if you actually carry out this experiment, you may or may not find hippocampal activity. And in this example here, uh, novel pictures were shown, and so novel uh, pictures are on the left, and familiar pictures are on the right. And in this graph here, what I'm showing is brain activity in the entire hippocampus um, versus rest. Viewing novel pictures versus rest, or viewing familiar pictures uh, versus rest. Um, there's two things I want you to notice here. One is, one is that neither condition is different from baseline, nor are the conditions different from each other. So um, first I'm going to talk about the issue of baseline. Rest sounds like a period of mental quietude, but it's actually a terrible condition if you want to study memory. And what's happening is in these structures, rest is actually a time of a lot of activity. And so it's not a good idea to use it as a baseline. When other types of baseline conditions are used, activity is actually higher for these tasks compared to rest. So, in the study by Kick Stark and Mary Squire from 2001, they presented uh, a number of different possible baselines. So, what you have here um, the red is a moving fixation cross, um, is an arrow pointing to the left or pointing to the right. Um, the ability to detect letter X in the right wing visual mask. And um, deciding if the digit was odd or even. <clears throat> so if we were just to choose the, the odd even baseline, for example, um, condition as the true baseline and compare the novel pictures and the familiar pictures for that, we actually get a fairly different picture. What we see here now is that the, the memory signals are now measurable. So we have something to measure. The next question is, um, why is activity the same for familiar items, which there should, should be a memory component, and novel items, where there should be no memory component? <clears throat> the reason that the hippocampus is active for both of these conditions is that it's active when people are remembering the familiar picture, but also when they're encoding into memory the novel picture. Both of these things are happening um, in the scanner. In this case, um, the activity level is the same. The condition was kind of um, the condition you would have expected the clinical activity, but the hippocampus is always on. It's always encoding what's going on. So one of the ideas is to just abandon altogether um, activity associated with the novel items and just focus on activity associated with the familiar items. So in this example, participants study words during a pre-scanning uh, study session. And then when they're in the scanner, they're showing those words again, and they decide uh, if the words are old or new. And what happens is some of the words are remembered, and other, some of the words are forgotten. You also intermix some new words um, to keep people on their toes as they're making the memory decision, but you don't use that data in the memory contrast. <clears throat> what you find when you carry this out, this task out, is that hippocampal activity is higher when, uh, for words that are remembered than words that are forgotten. Here is bilateral activity uh, in hippocampus. And other similar approaches have been used as well, and I'll touch a little bit on those ones later in the talk. Next, I'm going to discuss some advancements that have happened in the methodology, and these can apply to all the imaging studies, but they've been quite helpful in the study of memory because um, a lot of the study has been focused on one region, the hippocampus, and um, finding if the signal is present or absent in the hippocampus or whether memory modulates uh, activity there. And so what I'm going to talk about now is the alignment of brain regions across individuals. <clears throat> On the top, what you can see is a coronal, a an axial, and a sagittal scan from one subject. 
subject. And when scans are averaged across 15, subject, 15 subjects, the resulting image looks blurry. And this is because the anatomy is variable, and you end up um, averaging some of the white matter, some of the gray matter, and so you get kind of a fuzzy looking gray like this. And so what happens um, when you average uh, these data together are you warp, warp the data to a common space, and then you simply average um, voxel by voxel across all 15 subjects. <clears throat> Um, the problem that, ha that can arise when, with this method is that um, someone's white matter, like I said, can be averaged with another person's gray matter, or activity in one brain region from one person can be averaged with the activity in an adjacent brain region uh, in another person. So a better solution is to use a technique called ROI ANTS, and it's a region of interest alignment technique. And what you see on the bottom here are the same 15 brains aligned with this new technique. And one thing, the, the main thing to notice is that the quality here is as good as an individual subject. The, um, it's called ROI, and that stands for Region of Interest Alignment with Advanced Normalization Tools. And that was developed by Craig Stark, by UC Irvine, and uh, Brian Evans, who's at him. And the way the technique works is it uses manual tracing of region of interest along with the grayscale information to um, warp the images together, not necessarily just average them together. And um, it aligns the grades quite well. <clears throat> These same warping trajectories that are used on the anatomy are also used for the functional data. So this means that your functional data is also going to be better aligned. To illustrate, illustrate the um, exceptional alignment, I'm going to show you an example I've done using ROI ants. And what I've done here is I've drawn the entire hippocampus um, in 15 subjects. This is what it looks like if it was a cross-section through my drawing of one subject. And the entire hippocampus is about 3,400 microliters. So if we were to uh, align or average together um, all 15 subjects, you should expect about 3,400 microliters of tissue to be common to all 15 people. But if you use the traditional averaging technique, you find that only about 470 microliters of tissue actually lines up across all 15 subjects. And what you're looking at here is um, the scales on the bottom. So the bright red means all 15 subjects uh, share that part of the hippocampus. And as it gets closer to yellow, subjects are dropping off. And this is because the alignment is off. And so you see this small, small strip of red in the middle. That's the part of the brain that, um, if this were function true functional data, that's where you'd have the ability to look at your, your contrast of interest for all 15 subjects. <clears throat> the picture is much different if you use the ROI ANTS technique. Um, if you carry this out, uh, you get about 274 microliters of tissue. So you've got a much larger area to look in um, that possibly find your effect. This, um, the technique I've shown you here has been done with a region of interest in the campus, but it can also be done without a region of interest, and it can be done just relying on the grayscale and information that's contained in the T1 image, the standard T1 image. So, um, technique, technique like this can mean that you're going to have better alignment of anatomy, which means better alignment of function, and the increased likelihood of finding uh, an activated, activated region in your study. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to mention some precautions when interpreting uh, fMRI signals in the hippocampus. So, evidence from both animal and human lesion studies dating back from the 1950s has told us that the terminal lobe is involved in long term memory, but it's not involved in other aspects of cognition like short term memory, perception, reward decision-making, attention, or action. <clears throat> and since fMRI has come on the scene, it's not uncommon to find hippocampal activity associated with all of these factors. So if you look at evidence from imaging studies as well, you can find that um, a hippocampal cluster, cluster is active um, in, in all of these types of studies. Um, and the imaging findings are often interpreted in the context of only other imaging findings. So one of the things I'd like to, to convey to you today is that it's important
difficult to um, can, um, relate your fMRI study to other types of um, methods like lesion or signaling and recordings or um, something else to give um, a sense of history, a sense of contact with other, other types of methods that aren't simply correlational. Um, another thing that might, um, that might be happening here is that the hippocampus is always on, like I told you before. And so it might just be the case that in these studies, the hippocampus is encoding the elements of the task. So if you've done the study on short-term memory and the hippocampus is active in that task, it might be the case that that's because the people are going to remember the stimuli tomorrow, you know, tomorrow or the next day. Um, they've encoded those into memory. So um, <clears throat> the weight of evidence suggests that, um, from the lesion studies, suggests that uh, the hippocampus is involved in long-term memory and not these other types, other, other faculties. And so the, um, the limited perspective is a little worse. <clears throat> in fact, there's a special issue of the Journal of Experimental Psychology being planned right now that is devoted to um, this broader view of the hippocampus that's been revealed by imaging studies. Of these separations is 
possible um, by using a, a different type of anatomical scan, a T2-weighted anatomical scan. So what you see here on the left is the standard uh, one by one by one um, T1-weighted anatomical scan, where the hippocampus is just a gray blob. But if you do a T2-weighted scan with a much higher in-plane resolution, you can see that you start to see some of the structure within the hippocampus. And these are the types of scans that help you identify the boundaries And you can manually trace the subfields and help align functional data with ROIS technique that I told you about. Or you could uh, manually trace the structures and do kind of a region of interest analysis and the average uh, signal within each of the structures. With the help of the CAT Center here and Larry Squires lab, I've developed a high resolution protocol for imaging the middle triple lobe. And these, these voxels are 1.5 millimeters cubed. And, um, there are 19 of them, and in this case, we place them over the medial triple lobe. And uh, these imagers are required every three seconds. So those are good parameters for memory studies. Um, and pilot work with this new protocol shows that we can detect memory-related signals in the hippocampus in these subfields. So the last 10 years have seen a lot of progress from the first traditional loft designs with huge voxels to um, now memory-related uh, designs with, with smaller voxels, possibly even looking into the subfields of the hippocampus. So I'm optimistic that the next few years will also be as fruitful.